Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Yuri Zarubin. I'm a principal engineer from AWS. Uh, and today, we're going to be talking about managed Apache Iceberg with Amazon S3 tables. Uh, so before I start, just a quick show of hands. How many of you use S3? OK, well, pretty much everybody. Uh, thank you for being customers. Um, so uh, just a quick background about me. Uh, I've been with AWS for about eight years. That entire time, I've uh, entire time actually with S3. Uh, I'm, I've worked mainly with replication, S3 replication, if you've ever used that feature. And so actually this whole analytics space is relatively new to me. And so I'm super excited to be here. And uh, yeah, let's just talk about S3 tables. Okay, let's, so let's answer the what, right? What is S3 tables? Uh, Amazon S3 Tables is a new service for creating, managing iceberg tables. Uh, so uh, it's got uh, IAM-based access controls that we know and love. So think like bucket policies like S3. Uh, it has, on the performance side, 10 times higher TPS limits. So that ends up about 55,000 GET requests per second by default. We'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about later. Uh, and it's got automated table maintenance. So all the classics, you've got compaction, snapshot expiration, orphan deletion, and those come in like basically right out of the box, right? So as soon as you create a table, all of that stuff is enabled without you having to do anything. And then most importantly, it's fully compatible with Iceberg OSS, right? And again, we'll touch about, we'll talk about that a bit later. Okay. So what's new? So we have this new thing called an S3 table bucket. Um, what is an S3 table bucket? It's basically a new type of catalog that's built into S3. Uh, so, so as any catalog, uh, you know, you have it models namespaces and tables. Uh, it's got resource-based access control that I mentioned. Because of that, we have ARNs, specifically for tables. So this is what it looks like. And of course, it's uh, Iceberg REST catalog compatible. Now, the way we think about table buckets is you want to think about it as a, as a lightweight catalog, right? It's not a heavy catalog. It's not going to have all the bells and whistles. It's like the minimum that you need in order to get Iceberg up and running. All right, so let's go through the how. How do I use an S3 table bucket? Step one, you create a table bucket. So here I'm using the CLI. You can also use the console. So I just type AWS S3 tables, create table bucket, name my bucket. And I get back an ARN, right? Super, super simple. So we, we've really tried to hone in the CX such that it's like as simple as regular S3. So with just this one command, you're basically getting a full-fledged catalog created for you. Step two, you connect to it via the REST, uh, the REST endpoint. So here I've got an example using Spark SQL. Um, the key thing to note is that, that warehouse parameter, right? So that's going to be the place where you're just going to paste in that ARN that you got after you created the bucket. And then you're going to make sure that in the URI, you're going to type in the correct endpoint. So it's going to be S3 tables, you know, the region, amazonlbs.com slash iceberg. And so with that said, like you're ready to go. As soon as that loads up, you can create namespaces, create tables. Uh, right into the table, query the table, whatever you want. It just works. Uh, here's an example with DuckDB. Anybody use DuckDB? Hands? Nice. Awesome. So with Duck, we, we, the CX is even, uh, the, the experience is even simpler. You basically just paste in the ARN into the attached statement. You say that it's an iceberg, an endpoint type S3 tables, and then Duck does the rest. It configures everything. And then you can query it, uh, do whatever. OK, so now I want to talk about like, the mental model. right? How do we think about S3 tables compared to the older way of doing things? So with S3, we organize, uh, we organize our tables using prefixes. right? So first, we create our bucket. So then I have my S3 colon dash dash my bucket. Then, uh, depending on the catalog you use, you probably have like a namespace prefix. So in this case, I have a sales department.db. That's just a glue convention, but you know, your mileage may vary. Then you have your tables prefix. So you're going to do a slash customers. That's my table. And then within the customers, that's where, like, you know, you, you, that's basically where all the magic happens, right? That's where you're going to have your metadata folder. 
uh, which is going to contain the, contain the metadata.json, which is like the root of the iceberg table. And then you're going to have the data folder, which is going to have all your parquet, right? Um, and so if you look at this, really the, like, the S3 bucket, the namespace, the table prefix, all of that, it's really just modeling your table space. What, what's really important is actually just the last bit, like the metadata location and the data file prefix. That's actually where the iceberg sits. Everything else is, is, is just for organization. Now, when you have a large number of tables within a bucket, you, you get a couple of problems, right? First of all, your, uh, your bucket policies get really complex. If you're trying to limit who can access what tables, you have to edit like miles long uh, bucket policies, and that gets really hairy really quickly. So with tables, it gives you uh, a new way that you can organize using the table primitives. So we start off with the table bucket ARN. This is the thing that we saw before, right? So this is just the, the, the output from the create table bucket call. Then you have namespaces. Namespaces are just, are, you know, are just regular primitives inside of, a, inside, of a, uh, inside of table buckets because they are, uh, it's, at the end of the day, it's a catalog. Uh, then you've got tables, so we have customers. Then the interesting bit comes in. So if you look at the metadata location, right? So once we've created the table, and if we're using something like the REST catalog, we, if you, although you're not really gonna see this if you're using a query engine, but the query engine at the end of the day is gonna call load table on, on, on the endpoint, and it's gonna get back a metadata location URI. And this is what it's gonna look like in the, in the table's case. And if you can see the bucket looks kind of weird, right? Like it looks almost like a GUID with the dash dash table S3 at the end there. And this is, um, this is what we call uh, an S3 tables access point. And this is actually like the magic sauce behind tables. So this is the reason um, why we're able to have compatibility with Iceberg. So when you create a table, we create one of these access points for you. Uh, so this access point looks like a regular bucket. It's compatible with S3 clients. And it behaves like a normal bucket for gets and puts. One limiting factor is that it doesn't allow you lists and delete operations. Uh, and that one reason is because you don't actually need this for Iceberg. With Iceberg, you're, all of the query engines, they basically go down the query tree. They never really list or delete. That only happens for maintenance. And since we take care of the maintenance for you, you never have to call the, the list and deletes. <coughs> otherwise, um, otherwise, like if you see here, you always have access to the metadata.json, right? So if you, for some reason, said, hey, I don't want to use tables. I want to go somewhere else. Uh, you can always just read the iceberg table. It's there in raw format. Uh, there's nothing that's locking you in. Now, the reason why we went with this architecture is because uh, we can do interesting things with these access points. Um, one example is this. Has, has anyone seen this in their logs ever? Anyone familiar with this? Right, so this is, the, this is the, the Amazon S3 slowdown error, right? So this happens when you get throttled. So if you send a lot of traffic uh, into S3, uh, and you exceed the limits, so the, typically S3 has the, uh, the, it has a per partition limit of 5,500, uh, excuse me, yeah, 5.5 thousand gets, get requests, or 3.5K puts. If you exceed those limits, you get this. Right, saying, hey, slow down. Um, now that's an issue because if you create a table and suddenly you have a spike in traffic, S3, like S3, doesn't actually know that you have a table, right? For as far as it's concerned, you're just pushing a bunch of traffic into a prefix, it doesn't know anything about. Uh, so you get throttled. Now S3 eventually scales up once it realizes, oh, okay, you have a new table here. Let me you know, repartition your key space such that you have the proper uh, the, the you know your higher request limits. With tables, we basically avoid this problem by modeling, by modeling tables, right? So because we have access points, you can think of it almost like as a virtual bucket. So when you create it, you have this virtual bucket into some key space, and by default, it, you have higher limits. So you never run into this problem. Um, and uh, so the last thing I kind of want to cover is the, like, the why. You know, like why, why, why did we build this? 
surprisingly, I, I, when, I, when, I, when I first presented at reInvent, I had a lot of questions. It's like, hey, um, I thought you guys were object storage. You know, why are you building a new catalog? Why are you, uh, you, you know, what exactly is going on? And so the reason why we built this is because um, the first reason, uh, the most important reason, is that like, we got overwhelming customer demand that this is something that they wanted, right? Uh, we had a lot of feedback from customers. Uh, it's probably the most requested feature that I've ever seen is just the overwhelming demand for, hey, you know, we are struggling to maintain all these tables. Uh, maintenance is becoming complex. Uh, we have, we're, we've corrupted tables because somebody deleted the wrong thing. Uh, can you help us out? Uh, access policies is becoming complex. Uh, so that's one reason. The second reason is actually that uh, we realized we, we had a use case of our own for it, right? So if you've looked at the announcements, there's a, a feature called uh, S3 metadata that was released uh, at reInvent last year. So S3 metadata actually uses S3 tables to store, uh, well, the, the metadata. Uh, and so when we designed it, when we were designing it, we realized, hey, we actually needed something to, to leverage, to, uh, to expose as a primitive. And so we realized, okay, how about we, you know, we build a proper uh, table primitive into S3, and then we use that to, um, for our own features. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in like retrospect, I think it was a great decision. We had great feedback overall. Um, and uh, if you think about like S3, I think it's a natural evolution of the service, right? Because S3 started off as the, one of the original like blob stores uh, in the cloud. You, you know, customers would typically upload uh, things like backups, unstructured data, logs, and then as, uh, as we look at the evolution of the service, we see that a lot of the data being stored in S3 now is parquet, right? So the data is structured. And it kind of makes sense for the storage of the data, or the storage service rather, to actually be aware of, of the fact that the data is structured, right? Um, and uh, personally, I'm looking forward to various, like just various innovations that we could come up in this space. Um, now that we are actually like properly table aware, uh, and we understand uh, structured data. Uh, and with that said, I'll take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you specify the catalog per table, like if you want to like do multi-table things like joins or whatever, how, how does that work? Like you just spec like put all the catalogs for each table, or is that not the intended use case? What do you mean by pu putting a catalog in each table? Like in the Spark config that you showed. Like you showed like, where, like warehouse or catalog or something, and you put in the catalog name. I guess like if you have multiple tables, they each have their own GUID or whatever. Uh -huh. How do you yeah? How do you how do you do that? Right. So Spark doesn't care at all about that, right? So when um, it, so let's just say you load up Spark, you and you're gonna say, hey, show tables, show all tables. You're, it's gonna list all the tables they have, and they have different GUIDs as, as far as in the S3 bucket is concerned. Like Spark doesn't know anything about that because for every single table, it's gonna say, hey, load metadata for that table, and every time that happens, it's gonna have a different access point in the actual S3 URI. Correct, yes, right, yeah. Yep. Thanks for, thanks for the mic. So I've, thank you for this presentation. I've seen some, some tutorials online where you can use S3 tables with glue with, that are spun up via Terraform. Is there a difference in performance wise from the, how you showed it using the CLI spinning up a rest endpoint with S3 tables versus say I create a Terraform script, build an S3 table and then use something like AWS glue to, to ping slash get information from your tables? Um, in the, when you say performance, are you talking about like query performance? Uh, yes. My, my specific use case is I've, I've been trying to do this for like the past two months or so. Just like it, we, we have it working, just experimenting back and forth. And I haven't done anything with REST yet. I've only been using glue. So I was just wondering about performance of, of querying. Um, I think like the only difference is like the, the there's um, when you, when you first, when, 
So it depends on the size of your query. For large queries, it doesn't. It, I don't think there's any difference. For smallish query, I think there's a slightly higher uptime or start time for the for the glue queries because uh, glue does a bit more with like credential bending. It'll actually like assume a role and then bend the credentials. And so that initial latency, and we're talking about like in the milliseconds. So I don't know what, what to level of performance like you're looking for, but uh, it might be a few milliseconds slower. And that's about it. I just want my data and I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll get it. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you have. Or does S3 table support GeoParkway, or is there any plan for improving it's, the support? It's it, it, it'll support whatever your query engine supports. So we are like query engine agnostic, like we're a storage service and a catalog service. So it's purely to do with um, with the query engine that you're using. Okay. Hi, uh, great presentation. I have uh, one quick question. Uh, you briefly mentioned S3 tables has the compaction uh, built in. So could we tell a little bit more about how that's implemented? Um, I cannot go into too many, uh, too much of the specifics, but I can say that uh, right now we're using a lot of the, definitely a lot of the like the open source, uh, like the op open source routines. Uh, we recently launched uh, Z order and like the like the other sort order. Um, so you can do you can basically all of the all, all of the stuff that the open source uh, we support out of the box, uh, but definitely compaction is an area where we're still kind of exploring. We're we're still trying to figure out what types of workloads customers are running, uh, and that's definitely an area that we're gonna develop a lot more going forward. Okay. All right. Last question. I think we. You you wanna go for? I already asked this question. Oh, this one here. Oh, thank you. Um, so, quick question is: um, like, imagine a table. I'm I'm ingesting a lot of data into it, but I'm not querying the, querying the table that frequently. So, uh, can I tune the frequency of compaction to save costs? Uh, at the moment, you cannot tune the frequency of compaction. Uh, it's something that uh, we, you know, we we start automatically. But that that is definitely a common uh, common piece of feedback. So, it's something that we're thinking about. Um, uh, I have a question um, about a somehow related related technology to Iceberg, and which is Duck Lake, right? Which would offer a multi-table transactional updates. Um, is S3 Iceberg Table a part of an AWS strategy to support also this other new technology? We might see something like Duck Lake also supported. Uh, it's definitely an option. Yes, we designed it in a way such that we could potentially support like any type of uh, OTF. So yes, for sure. If, if it's something that it makes sense for us to do, we'll yeah, we, we would consider it. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank Th you. Thank you all.